Good morning. So good. To, wasn't that a great song? Man, that was just beautiful. Awesome, awesome worship. We're blessed. Uh, they're getting ready to release their first original worship CD. They've written and produced amazing music. You know that Pastor Jason writes with Jake from Red Rocks. They've written much of the music that's out there. And uh, so we're very excited about having our, our worship CD to really get the gospel out to more people and just encourage believers. So keep your eyes open. That's coming uh, at the end of our 50 days of good news. You're like, what's that? That's our spiritual campaign this fall. Set aside everything. Move heaven and earth to be here for 50 days because it will transform your life like nothing else. And if it doesn't, I just wasted 28 hours a day. That's right, 28 hours a day writing this. I had to get it all done in the last week, and uh, we're going to be shooting the videos with Life Together next week, and I'm just very, very excited about what God's going to do. Our entire staff is pouring into this, and it's going to be life-changing. We're going to go over the gospel and what it means, the life in six words, but really unpack them. A lot of times you just hear the gospel, God created us to be with him, our sins separated us from God, sins can't be erased by good deeds, paying the price for sin, Christ died and rose again. Everyone that trusts in him has everlasting life and life that's eternal lasts forever. The truth of the gospel, I don't mean to belittle it by going quickly. However, each of those is a week that we're going to invest in understanding what it means. And by the time you're done, you'll not only understand salvation, understand how to share it, but you'll be equipped to take good news into the world. You think we could use some good news? Or you want to talk about the next variant? Would you like, I can talk about the next variant if you like to, because they're going to keep coming. Uh, and so I just want to encourage you. We're going to talk about good news and really focus on the good news. This week, the restaurant of the week is our uh, Asian fusion. It's Ming's Asian fusion over at 9604 Ralston Road. Get over and eat as much Asian fusion as you can and support this business here locally. We are helping our businesses every week for the entire year of 2021. It's been very cool to see what God is doing. And you know, as I came out, I was, I was just thinking about this. Um, we're going to look at, obviously, the question, uh, how do we make Jesus our everything? And maybe, maybe for you, you're like, I'm just trying to figure out if Jesus is real. That's great. I'm glad you're here. Glad you're watching. Hello to everybody watching online and our virtual church, literally around the world. Just talked to uh, Doug and Blanca, our missionaries in Peru, just before they went in to the conference. I was unable to go this year, uh, lots of reasons, but uh, they just went in for the conference, our annual conference. We have gone from 47 churches and pastors that we employ in the Amazon jungle to 47 and 50 pastors. So 47 churches and 50. So 37 to 47, 50 pastors. Man, it, it, it is mind-blowing what God is doing there. So great job. Thank you for your support and prayers and commitment to this ministry because it's working globally. And then I got to say thanks to Pastor Paul because this old man totally lost track. I'm writing all these studies, writing all this stuff. Poor Paul goes on vacation. He's been working on a sermon that I just went ahead and wrote. <clears throat> So I text him, say, Paul, I wrote it, and my wife thought we were going away for a weekend. We're not. Can you let me preach? He's like, yeah, no problem. So uh, very gracious. But we, we're making our way through the Bible in 90 days. I hope you're doing your reading. Uh, I'm almost finished with, as a matter of fact, I just finished the Old Testament. I'm a little ahead of you. And if you haven't even started, that's okay. Start now. Uh, we have all kinds of ways to help you. We have the reading schedule you cannot go to the Word of God and not be transformed. You can't read it and not be impacted. It's absolutely impossible. It's the living, breathing Word of God. And we're going to talk about how to make Jesus my everything. Now, we're going to do this by looking at the gospel and really looking at Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the book of Acts. Let me just tell you something theologically technical, and this is true. I'm not joking. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not the New Testament. You're like, wait, it says that in my Bible. Yeah, that's just a division by translators. Remember, there were no chapters, uh, there were no verses in the original writings. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Jesus fulfills the law in the Old Testament. Where does the church age start? Where does the dispensation of grace start? It starts in Acts chapter 2. 
okay? So I just want you to know that technically. Now, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are, are really one of the most, let's just say, the most well-rounded perspectives of an individual life like Jesus. That's why sometimes you read in Matthew, you have a different story than Mark. That's why you have different details in Luke than you have in John. Let me just show you why that's the case. Let me have you do something. Just put your stuff down for a second. Look around the room in five, for five seconds when I say now. Now, look around the room. Notice something, okay? Get your eyes off me. Look at something else, all right? Thank you. All right, now, stop. What'd you notice? Somebody raise your hand. What'd you notice? First thing you noticed. Yes. Oh man, smile more. I love it. That, so we got the smile more shirt. First thing that noticed, all right, that was noticed. What else? What'd you know? What? Heads. heads. <laughs> Lots of heads. Bald heads. Uh, yeah. Glad I'm standing up here looking at you. Uh, what else did you notice? Yeah. Colors. colors. Yeah. Oh yeah. Colors of shirts, different colors. Guys, who was right and who was wrong? Nobody's wrong. Everybody has a, that's right, they're all right. Everybody has a different perspective. And so what we have in the Gospels is not some kind of inaccuracy. As a matter of fact, we have a more accurate picture because God allows the personality of the writers, there's only one author, God, the four writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and of course five books because Luke wrote Acts as well, to give us a perspective of Jesus. Now, in this, we learn how to make Jesus our everything. But before we can get there, I want to give you a summary, as I've been doing every week, and, and Paul did every week, a summary of each of the books we're going to look at. So jot these down, pay attention to them very quickly. This will help you understand, especially when you're reading. And I'm a guy that likes alliteration, not alliteration. Uh, I like alliterating uh, and illustrating so that you can remember uh, what these books are about. It's hard to sum up the Word of God in a paragraph, okay? So here's Matthew. Here's the big idea of Matthew. Jesus is revealed as the King of the Jews after 400 years of silence. You're like, what's that mean? Go back and listen to last week's message, okay? 400 years of silence, but he comes not as a conquering king, but as a humble, circle this, selfless king to rule in the hearts of all who believe in him. Jesus is the selfless king in the book of Matthew, okay? So remember that as you're reading. Look at Matthew 28, uh, 20, 28. This sums it up. Look at it. For even the Son of Man came to be served, uh, but to, not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, did not come to the earth to be served. Does that not blow your mind? He came to serve. Did you know that when we get to heaven, Jesus is still going to serve us the marriage feast of the Lamb? God glorified the creator and sustainer of our life. Now that is a selfless king. The book of Mark, big idea. Jesus is revealed as a simple man in simple terms who did miraculous works among simple people like me and like you. Jesus is the servant king of the world. Now, you're saying, well, isn't servant and selfless the same? No. You can be a selfless person and never serve. Think of yourself less. But serving, there are a lot of people that serve and they're not selfless. They do things for others because they like the praise, they like the reputation, they like being noticed. So both of these are uniquely different. Jesus was selfless. Look at Mark chapter 10. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be, a, be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. You know, we have the privilege in this ministry of marrying and, and officiating weddings for hundreds and hundreds of people. I personally have married over 600 people in 36 years. And here's what I've noticed. No matter how much you counsel them up front, it never quite works out the way they think it's going to after they get married. I literally got a text this morning from a wonderful couple. I love them. 
and a wonderful young man. And there's struggles already, and it's been pretty recent. Here's the challenge. I told him, don't feel bad. My wife and I's honeymoon was over about an hour after we got married. So it's okay. It's okay. You made it longer than I did. All right? Now, when you are selfless, you, you, you think about the other person more than you think about yourself. When you're a servant, you serve them. Like, I want to make you happy. I want to please you. Can you imagine what every marriage would look like if we both did that? In the book of Luke, here's the big idea. Jesus is revealed, by the way, Luke is not a disciple. He's not an original disciple. He could have been one of the 70, but Luke was a medical doctor. He was a Gentile, probably Greek. And Jesus is revealed as the Messiah of the world. He is the one who fights the enemy, Satan, while fulfilling the scriptures of the law, the prophets, and the poetry books. Jesus is, circle it, the sacrificial king. He's the sacrificial king. He's not just selfless. He's not just a servant. He is a sacrificial king. And look at what Luke says in chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to what? Seek and save those who are lost. That's my wife. Tell her I'll bring milk. Oh, my wife's here. Hi, babe. I didn't know you were here. Shocked me. She's usually here on Saturday. So here, here's the deal. Uh, gosh, I go, well, did I write anything else about her in here? No, okay. Um, so Jesus is the sacrificial king. King, and he came to seek and save the lost. I said it in the first service today uh, and last night. It's, it's very simple. As believers in Jesus Christ, as a church, if we are not seeking to see people saved, close the stinking doors. We are not a country club for Christians. We're not a holy huddle for the frozen chosen. We're a place that is reaching lost and broken people. Because in case you haven't noticed, you're broken, and if you're a Christian, you were once lost. John, the big idea, is Jesus is revealed as the great I am. That's the personal name of God, and one who gives salvation to all who simply believe in him. Jesus is the saving king of the world. Let me just say this. The word believe, pisteo, is the same as trust and faith. They're the exact same Greek word. They all mean the same thing, to fully rely on. The word believe is used 99 times in the book of John. The book of John is the only book in the Bible written to the lost person. That will really help you in understanding the Bible in general. Okay? Look at John 1 verse 12. But to you, to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave them the right to become children of God. Oh my goodness, we are... We are children of God. You're like, aren't, we're all children of God, preacher. No, we're not. This always upsets people. I get emails every time I say it. So don't send me emails. Just listen, okay? When we're born into this world, we're born in sin. Because Adam sinned, we have been infected with the disease of sin and death. We're all depraved. And the Bible says we are separated from God. We are not connected to God. We are separated from God. We are created in his image. Our human uh, image is created in the image of God, but the sin nature has infected it. Therefore, we are destined for a Christless eternity until we're born again. When that happens, we become children of God with all the rights and privileges of a child of God. So you're not a child of God if you just think Jesus was a cool dude or you're okay with religion or you're not okay with religion or you just reject it all. You're only part of God's family when you admit you're a sinner and trust in Jesus as your Savior. In the book of Acts, after Jesus died and rose again, he before he ascended, he resurrected and he spent the next 50 days basically uh, showing himself in his glorified state to everybody who was around him. 515 people witnessed Jesus after his resurrection. That would stand up in any court of law. And they were not just willing to live their lives quietly for Jesus. They went out and turned the world upside down and suffered greatly and died for him. Look at this. Jesus is revealed as a glorified God-man who empowers the church through his Holy Spirit. Jesus gives the great commission to the body of the church as the sending king. Look at Acts chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit 
comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up in a cloud while they were watching. Take that, Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. He didn't even need a rocket ship. He just launched and they could no longer see him. It's such an amazing story. And so we have these five books written by four people, author God, and he tells us what kind of king Jesus is and what kind of king he remains. Now, how does that impact us as Christians to make him our everything? I want you to write this down. First, in the book of Matthew, it's about accepting salvation, first of all, from the selfless Savior once you've accepted salvation, you don't accept Jesus, even though you'll kind of see transliterations that say that. You'll even see one today. We don't accept Jesus. He accepted us. We accept the gift of salvation through our selfless Savior when we believe that he died for us. But once we become a Christian, we need to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We need to surrender to him moment by moment, day by day. Now, in Matthew chapter 9, You'll see a lot of different miracles. You'll see a lot of different things that Jesus did. We're going to talk about those. Most of the miracles or the miraculous uh, um, stories are in the book of Mark, but Matthew has plenty. But one of the cool statements that Jesus makes that, that was actually um, a reference to Hosea 6.6. 6. Some of you remember I shared Hosea 6.6, 6, one of my favorite verses. It says, I don't want your sacrifices. I want your love. I don't want your, your burnt offerings. I want you to know me. That's what God wants. And Jesus said it this way. He said, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they're sinners. Now, guys, the hardest person you will ever lead to Jesus is the person who thinks they're righteous. Who thinks, oh, you know, preacher, that's good. There are a lot of really bad people out there. I'm not one of them. Until we understand the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the fact that we can't even stand in his presence without being consumed apart from Jesus because of his holiness, we don't understand our sinfulness. And if we don't understand our sinfulness, we'll never understand salvation. Because if I don't know I need a savior, then why would I believe in Jesus as my savior? So Jesus sets the, the, the record straight by saying, listen, God doesn't want all these acts of righteousness, Jewish people. He wants your faith. Now, I love this too, because the first declaration of faith among the disciples, the first disciple to profess saving faith was Peter. These guys had followed Jesus, 12 of them, for three and a half years Three of them had seen more miraculous things than the others, Peter, James, and John, and yet after almost three and a half years, they're still kind of looking at him like, this guy does some crazy stuff, but I'm just not sure if he's God. And then he asked Peter, who do people say I am? Peter says, ah, some say you're Elijah, some say a prophet. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, Jesus replied. You are blessed. Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. He says, listen, Peter, you're a Christian. You're a believer. You're the first believer of my 12 disciples. Isn't that interesting? A lot of people consider themselves disciples of Jesus. They go to church. They, they, they follow his teachings to, you know, to a certain degree. Think he was good. But they've never come to the place in their life where with their open, empty hands of faith, they say, I have nothing to bring to the table. I believe Jesus did it all, and I trust in him. <clears throat> we also see in that story that once you become a believer, you do not become perfect. You're perfect in God's sight. You're still sinful. Because in a, just a moment after Peter makes a profession of faith, Jesus said, I'm going to be delivered in the hands of sinful men to be crucified and, and tortured and killed. And, and Peter goes, oh, no, 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 no. That's, that's not happening on my watch. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the things of God in mind. Ouch. Wait, I, wasn't I the, 
top of the class just a minute ago? It's like, yeah, so probably keep your mouth closed. That'd be a good thing, right? Now, I love this story because God still continues to allow Peter to see some amazing things. One of those is when Peter, James, and John see Jesus at the transfiguration. Now, this is the one moment at, before his resurrection that Jesus shows Peter, James, and John his glorified condition as God. And this is crazy. Look at this. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, led them up to a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. By the way, that's why a lot of people think Moses and Elijah will be the two witnesses during the tribulation. It says, they began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. I'm sure Peter's thinking, I get the point. Don't make uh, altars to the other two guys, just, just Jesus, right? And then they look up, and Jesus is back in his human form. That is an incredible story that demonstrates our first challenge in making Jesus our everything. Accept him, the free gift that he's given you, and surrender to his lordship. And by the way, I know too many Christians who think that surrendering to the lordship of Christ is something they do. Oh yeah, I did that at camp. We like, I was like 16 and we took a stick and threw it in the fire and Lord, you're my everything. And I, I don't mean to mock that. We do that in our youth camps. I think it's a great thing. That doesn't mean you're not going to have to surrender to his lordship later that afternoon, that night, when you get married hourly, <laughs> right? You have children moment by moment right? Because we're flesh. We still have the sin nature. It's not gone yet. Second, if we're going to make Jesus our everything, Mark says we need to believe he is a servant king who still does miracles. You believe that? He still does miracles. Jesus did more miracles in the, in the book of Mark. They're, they're talked about more in Mark than any of the other gospels. And one of the most perplexing I think miracles that's often, you know, missed in this, uh, this story is that Jesus was a carpenter. He came from a very low class family. He had no formal education. Now I understand for some of us, we don't get this because you can today not have a formal education in high school or college and you can learn a heck of a lot. You've got all kinds of avenues to learn. You can read, you can Google, you can do a lot of stuff to learn information. In those days, if you didn't have education, if you were not the elite class of Jews or Romans, you were dumb. You were considered dumb. Matter of fact, illiterate. So look at this. Jesus left that part of the country, returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, brother James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. Now, here's, here's the deal. Jesus did a miracle right there. At least it looks like it from a human perspective because he knew the law better than men who studied Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy so well that they could quote it word for word in the original Hebrew without mistakes. How did Jesus know more than them? Because he wrote the book. You know, Jesus did miracle after miracle. Once Jesus fed 
thousands, 5,000. Now, anytime you see 5,000 or 10,000, you got to remember that in those days, 2,000 years ago, they only counted men, sometimes boys. So 5,000 was probably more like 7,500 to 10,000. And 7,500 was probably more like 12 to 15,000. Now, does it really matter if you're feeding that many people? If you can feed 10 people with a couple fish and a few loaves of bread, you're doing good. And Jesus fed thousands. And then the disciples departed. They're on the Sea of Galilee. They're out in a boat and a storm comes up. And I love this. Look, but when they saw him walking on the water, they cried out in terror, thinking he was a ghost. They were all terrified when they saw him. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I'm here. Then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. They were totally amazed. Like, dude, wow. Okay, now I want you to think about this. Jesus showed them his power before he calmed the storm. Jesus didn't calm the storm, walk across, you know, a glassy ocean. And there's a, there's a message in that. Sometimes we just want God to calm the storm. And sometimes he's saying, I'm not going to calm the storm. This storm is exactly where I want you. So I can demonstrate my power. So that I can show you that I'm God of heaven and earth. Because he cares more about my character than my comfort. My integrity than my image because he cares more about where I'm going than where I'm at. In Mark eleven seventeen, 17, he said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. What was going on? They turned the temple into a bazaar, into a flea market. And Jesus was upset. He had righteous indignation. He saw that the temple, remember, he hasn't resurrected yet. The Holy Spirit is not indwelling the temple of man yet. So that was still the presence of God in the temple. And Jesus is like, you're not going to turn my father's house into a den of thieves. I've had people ask, well, didn't Jesus like really walk a fine line? I mean, maybe he sinned there. No, he didn't sin. He's the only human who had truly righteous indignation. I had one of my friends go, I just have righteous indignation toward that group. I go, no, you don't. You can't have righteous indignation. Do you know why? The reason we can't have righteous indignation is we have to have, if we're going to be righteously angry, we can't have any pride, we can't lose any control, and we can't have any selfish motivation. Tell me the last time you were angry without the three of those. Didn't happen. Hasn't happened in my life either. But it did with Jesus. He did not sin. Another amazing miracle and passion where he demonstrates this. As the servant king, I am God in the flesh. In the book of Luke, we get a very specific and, and not just accurate, they're all accurate, but a very specific detailed presentation of Jesus because he is a doctor, a medical doctor. Look at this. Choose to yield daily to our sacrificial king who defeated Satan at the cross. He's the sacrificial king, and he defeated Satan. Some of you are like, well, you know, I was okay with this until you started talking about that real devil. Listen, if you believe in a real God, it's not a stretch to believe in a real devil since he said he exists. As a matter of fact, when Jesus walked on earth, all hell breaks loose. Why? Because Satan pulled out all the stops. He thought if there's any chance of winning this war against God, I've got to kill his son. Look at what he does. When he can't defeat him, he takes him up on a mountain. Then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. Before I read on, he's a liar. I've actually heard pastors say, see, Satan is the God of this world. No, he isn't. You're like, well, wait, there's a verse that says that. Let me explain. He runs amok in this world. He puts all kinds of trash in this world and people chase after it. But there is still one God over this world. And nothing happens that doesn't pass through his hands. 
Jesus replied, the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. I love that. Just kind of a mic drop moment, right? Go back to God only allowing things to happen according to his will. What happens in the life of Job? Satan has to ask God for permission to make a disaster. Now, Jesus, this sacrificial king, sacrifices himself in the most unbelievable way. I mean, Luke covers the last 12 hours of the life of Christ from a very descriptive way. A matter of fact, it starts in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus takes who? Peter, James, and John. And he takes him to a little hill and they go to pray, and he, he says, you guys stay here. I'm going to go a stone's throw away and pray. He, he walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of, of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Now, there's not a time I teach on this. I don't say that is a real medical condition, hematidrosis. Corpuscles burst in the pores, blood and water flow out. Jesus is not the only one in medical history to have had this happen. But it also can be accompanied with ocular vision impairment, uh, loss of hearing, passing out. I mean, you can lose consciousness. Jesus was going through it. God sent an angel to attend to him because there was a raging battle in the Garden of Gethsemane because Jesus knew what was coming. He knew every ounce of suffering. And guess who he was thinking about? You. Like you're the only person who ever existed because he can do that. And Jesus goes through this agony. He's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's marched to six trials. In five of those six trials, he is beaten over and over. He has his beard ripped from his face, hair ripped from his... As a matter of fact, he's, three of those were Roman, three were Jewish. Brutal, brutal uh, 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 beatings that took place. By the time Jesus had a crown of thorns bashed into the skull that suffered hematidrosis and was had a 110-pound cross beam placed on his back, he was at a human level of being unable to move much further. Finally, Jesus gets to Golgotha, and they, they nail him to that, that cross beam. They raise that cross beam up and drop it in the post. I know that's not what Hollywood depicts, but that's what it was. And it says all of his bones were out of joint, and he didn't even look like a human being. And while he's there, on each side are two thieves. And this account... It's so good. Look at this. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God? Even when you have been sentenced to die, we deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. H hold on. He, he figured all that out by Jesus just being hung next to him? I think he was probably the guy, the thief, that as Jesus was speaking to thousands of people, he was pickpocket artist. He was in and out of the crowd. He was stealing stuff. But he was hearing Jesus talk. He was seeing Jesus walk. And now he's hanging there next to the Son of God. And he says, Lord, if you could just remember me. He had already put his trust in Jesus. And look what he says. And Jesus said, remember me. When you come into your kingdom, he said, and Jesus replied, I assure you, circle those three words, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Guys, you can have assurance of salvation. Jesus said so. And it doesn't depend on you, what you've done or what you'll ever do. It has everything to do with what he did and believing that he did it for you. That's the assurance of salvation. What, pray tell, did this thief do to deserve salvation? Nothing. By the way, did he get baptized? Did he go to confession? Did he pray the rosary? Did he talk to a pastor? Did he raise his hand? Did he say the sinner's prayer? No, he believed and he received salvation. Boom, done. 
That's the gospel. Such a powerful picture from a doctor. In the book of John, the only book written in the entire Bible to the lost person, we determine to share the saving king with anyone we can. If you want to make Jesus your everything, and if he becomes your everything, you'll want to share him with everyone. You ever been in love? You tell everybody about that person. I texted my wife the other day. I was in a, a, a golf tournament I play with my son, and uh, my oldest son. And uh, I said, honey, I was just talking about you. She's like, oh, no, what are you saying? I'm just like, how awesome you are. While I'm on the golf course, that's a pretty big deal, right? Because you're awesome. We'll be married 36 years soon. <clears throat> I'm the 17th of this month. And, uh, and I mean, my mom actually said the date. She's like, 17th, 17th, she's sick. Thanks, mom. But, uh, but here's the deal. I, I talk about her all the time. You know, when you love somebody, you talk about them. You know, Jesus was the living, breathing word of God. Look at this in John 1. In the beginning, the word already existed. Guys, we're talking the very, very beginning of the universe. The word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and, is, and this life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Amen? Jesus is, always, will be, is, was, and always will be God. Now, in this life that Jesus walked on earth, he broke all kinds of stereotypes, all kinds of traditions. The Jews couldn't stand the Samaritans. They hated them because they were half-breeds, half-Gentile, half-Jew. They considered them dogs, literally. So what does Jesus do? He's out with the disciples. They're walking. They would walk around Samaria. Jesus says, hey, guys, I'm going to Samaria. They're like, we're going to McDonald's. We're going to go get food. Jesus is like, I'm going in Samaria. He walks in, and then what's he do? He goes up to a woman. Men did not speak to women. They did not speak to Samaritan women. And this woman wasn't just a Samaritan woman. She had a little bit of a jaded past. He walks up. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, if you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Let me just make a quick uh, uh, evaluation of this. Use every single opportunity to share the love of Christ. It's a drink of water. I want a drink of water. All of a sudden, we're talking about heaven. I told you, when I'm on an airplane, I always get stuck next to somebody who hates to fly. I use that. Like, you know, if we died, where would you go? <laughs> Captive audience. All right, so here's the deal. This woman was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. And then she believes, she trusts in Jesus. Look at John 4. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. And she believed. She put her trust in Jesus Christ. Now, he asked her, uh, ma'am, uh, where's your husband? She said, oh, um, I don't have a husband. He's going, yeah, that's true. You had five husbands. And the man you're with now isn't your husband. She's like, oh, boy. And I love what she said. Look, after she becomes a believer, it says, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two more days, long enough for many more to hear the message and believe. Let me just say this. Jesus did not tell her everything she's ever done. Why did she say that? Because so often we identify with just our sin the worst things we've ever done. You know what Jesus does? He says, that's not your identity anymore. You're my child now. That's gone. Today's a clean slate, fresh start. And guys, let me remind that, that reality to you right now. It's gone. If you're a Christian, it's a clean slate today. New beginning. 
You know what you do is you, you take the pain and the hurt and the experiences of the past and you use them for the kingdom. About a year or so ago, my oldest son, who was a paramedic firefighter for about 10 years in a very difficult, very bad area, he started suffering some stuff and he keeps it inside uh, and PTSD issues and some drinking issues and some things that he, he was struggling big time. And he decided to take that pain and turn it into a ministry, actually a nonprofit to help firefighters and first responders, police officers. And then COVID hit. And, and already in the midst of all of that, there had been the riots and so much hatred and so much tension. And so as he did that, we have been the first responder church for our community. We do the memorials for the firefighters, police officers. We're here for them and their families. But I want to show you something. I want to introduce you to a person that can't be here. She was supposed to be here today. She's homesick. Ellie, we're sorry. But I'm going to share a little bit about Tribe in just a minute. Take a look at this. I decided to join the fire department really when I got out of college. Just kind of explored what that looked like and I knew I didn't want to do a desk job and really that's what led to me and my best friend to join the fire department together. It's an awesome career. Just the team and the camaraderie and the firehouse life. Just having the ability to truly give back, help people on their worst days. One of the key adversities that guys face on a day-to-day -day basis is just seeing death and seeing the demise of humanity, so to speak. And then having to go home and interact with your own family, having outside stressors and then having to come to work. And then obviously the sleep deprivation, I think is a, is a huge challenge that these guys have to figure out ways to overcome. You know, we build a wall between our head and our heart because we got to run calls with our head. But when we get home, at times, it's tough navigating that wall emotionally with our family and our friends. Probably two or three times the size of his old shop. Really? Yeah, I almost need you guys to pull an extinguisher. Yeah. This thing wasn't in all the way. It caught on fire. <laughs> Firemen making fireworks. <laughs> and... You're the only sandwich in here with uh, gluten-free bread, too. Okay, cool. One of the key reasons that I started Revital was to get guys to just get away from things that they see on a daily basis. <laughs> I think the negative stigma regarding mental health and wellness and reaching out for just a discussion, I think that comes from just years and years of suppression. So many of us feel that our identity is in our job. In reality, who you are is more about who you are inside, you know, who you are to the people around you. Revital is an organization here to support our first responders. We want to bring platforms for connection with other first responders that understand these challenges. I told him he's going to split an arrow out here. He's real fun on the cattle drives. He's got more, more go than woe, that's for sure. The structure of Revital is pretty simple. We have myself and other guys who enjoy outdoor activities. Guys are just willing to take people out to have experiences that they enjoy. Because <laughs> really the outdoors has its own therapeutic effect because it's, it's beautiful. Natural conversations occur, you don't have to force them. And we're not afraid just to talk about what, what's going on in our lives. If you come on a Revital trip, we try to meet at a place called The Shop, where we can meet, have a quick cup of coffee, people can leave their cars, jump in my truck or the host vehicle, and we try to pick places that are hour, two hours away, so that we can drive and just get to know one another because when we get to the place that we're going, we want to just be able to enjoy the activity and let nature do what it does. Then that's what we believe kind of deepens those relationships. We just allow the day to take over and the natural relationships and conversations to occur, revitalizing mind, body, and spirit so that you can have longevity in your career. 
longevity in your relationships. Yeah. So guys and gals, men and women, families, uh, Jordan and Kim both are leading these outings and it's been phenomenal. And I would encourage you to go to revital.com and read some of the stories. He just took the police officer from Commerce City who had to shoot and kill the assailant that was trying to stab him to death. And he said, you know, they, they were able to get out on the river, just the two of them. And what he wrote was powerful, but he said, it doesn't matter if somebody's trying to kill you or not. When you take a life, you're taking a life. And it's, it, it wounds you and it affects you. And so Jordan has connected with other organizations, us being one. Uh, you saw Corey and Dax, two members of Grace that have come here through their connections with Jordan and the fire department. And that's what we've been watching is just powerful connection. But he introduced me to Ellie and uh, wow, what an impressive woman. And she's going to be teaching here at Grace in our family support classes. I want to read this to you. Tribe is an eight week program it's specifically designed for veterans and first responders. So if you're a veteran, a veteran family member, first responder, it was created by an Air Force psychiatrist, Ellie, as she had navigated a traumatic brain injury, complex trauma after being trained to treat military members for the same conditions during her career. Tribe helps cultivate an authentic community through drawing people closer to God and coming alongside veterans, military members, and first responders in order to sharpen each other and wrestle with questions, stressors, and learning to hold on to God and hope regardless of the situation in a confidential setting. And the program is one of two available through the nonprofit Advancing Warriors International. I've gone through all of this material. I am so impressed. It is so amazing to have a psychiatrist, a military hero that's teaching in our ministry. So on Thursday nights, we have all of our family support classes. Look them up. You can go out today and sign up for Tribe. Uh, it starts here in just a couple of weeks. You do not want to miss it if first responder, uh, military. Uh, we would love to be there for you. Me, you may be hurting in ways you don't even know. You haven't even been able to identify. And then check out the other family support classes. I always say this to people. Uh, we have classes for virtually everything you're going through, whether you're getting married, you've been through a divorce, you're getting remarried, uh, you're raising children, you're single and parenting. Um, it's all right here. We've got grief share if you've lost a loved one, overcome for uh, uh, mental illness, the, the smart step family. These are taught by incredible people in this ministry. You do not want to miss it Thursday nights. And let's end with this. You become a lover of Jesus. He becomes your everything. From the book of Acts, when you express the sending king's life-changing message and mission. When you start to share that, then you know Jesus is your everything. Because this, let's be honest, it's where most Christians draw the line. Oh, my faith's very personal to me. Yeah, I don't really talk about it. You know, that's the exact opposite. He wants you to talk about it because there's a world of people that only you will have contact with. I won't. In Acts chapter one, after Jesus resurrected, after he gave the great commission I showed you, we see this story of him blasting off, literally leaving planet earth, right? And as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white robed uh, men suddenly stood among them, men of Galilee. They said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken away from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. And I'll just add this. Now get busy. Take the gospel to the world. And you know what they did? They turned the world upside down with 120 people. Billions have been rescued from a Christless eternity. Have heard the message of hope through Jesus Christ because of 120 people. Can you imagine what thousands could do if we've committed ourselves to the good news of Jesus? And that's exactly what we're here to do. We have a sacrificial, selfless, serving, sending king. Is he your everything? Because you only believe the parts of the Bible you actually do. And Jesus is only your everything if he is. You put your time and your talent and your treasure into him. Let me have you bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute.
Maybe you're here, and for you, you don't know for sure, or at least didn't, that if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. I want to challenge you right where you're at. Believe and receive that gift right now, right where you're at. You can just talk to God silently in your mind. Say something like this, God, I'm a sinner. I've done things wrong, I admit it. But I believe that Jesus Christ died for me 2,000 years ago. I believe he was buried and he rose again. And I received the free gift of salvation. Thank you, God. Friend, welcome to the family of God. I want to pray for you. I'm not going to have you stand up or come forward, but just a moment. If that made sense, and today you're receiving that free gift, I'm going to have you raise your hand and put it right back down. That just tells me you got it. So if you're saying today, I believe and I receive that gift, would you slip your, God bless you too. Would you just slip your hand up and put it right back down? God bless you. Praise God. God bless you. I see your hand back there. Thank you. God bless you. Praise God. Christians, nothing in the world matters more than that. People pass from death unto life. In this ministry, we wouldn't want to see you come to know Jesus and then just leave you out there in a very difficult world. We're here for you, and we make it simple. You can let us know who you are. Just text the word BELIEVE to 720-895-9000. We'll get back with you this week. We have a Bible for you, and we want to welcome you to the family of God. Father, thank you for the free gift of salvation that cost Jesus everything. We're so grateful, Lord. May we love Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.